goodness, it finally happened. I had a good reading month. It's been like three months. Finally, the universe is done punishing me. I don't know what I did wrong. I don't. Sure, I hate Kafka on the Shore. Apparently, it's a modern classic. Apparently, I have bad taste. But I didn't deserve three months of just reading meh. But I'm back now, baby. I might even smile a bit in this video because I read some good books. Oh, what is up, you guys? It's me, your girl, Casey. How you doing? I managed to read seven books this month. In my TBR, I originally planned to read ten books. I've yet to finish the two books I was asked to review, Pigeon Blood Red, Wildcat, in the book, you guys voted on The Secret History. Those are the first books I'm gonna finish this month in May. I had an eclectic reading month. I had a wide variety of genres. I went to the library a ton, which is something I never do and I'm now kind of obsessed with. It's gonna play a big part in a future video I got planned. So stay tuned to that. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that fancy jazz. I read Furthers. I read fantasy. I read a really sciencey book. I read a dead awful book. Oh my gosh. You know, for me, a good reading month, has some good books, but it has one book that I hated along with it because I really I like getting angry every now and then. It's good, it's healthy for you to like have something to vent at once in a while. But I also, after three long, terrible months of YA books just letting me down constantly, my faith has been restored in the genre. I found two super good YA books, and it comes from the most unlikely of series. So I have seven books to talk about. We're gonna work our way up. So we're gonna start with my one star book of the month. I just have one. I have a whole separate dedicated book review for it where I go much more in depth. But this, like, I like being mean. I enjoy the bitterness of being me. But this meanness right here is intensely justified and you would get what I'm saying if you read the book even if we break. Go on Goodreads right now. Look at the abysmal star rating it has. Last I checked it was like 2 2.97. Very very bad. And when I saw that like honestly if someone tells me that this book is terrible I'm immediately going to read it. And so just seeing those measly two stars I was like yes I will do this. And I've never ever regretted a decision as much as that one. Honestly, though I may hate Kafka on the shore, and that book has a special little place at the bottom of my black black heart. At least in Kafka on the Shore, like, they're good characters. Like, they're believable, they're complex, and they feel like real humans. Way to go, Haruki Murakami. You get one star out of me for character development. Yeah. Could you do without the incest though, please? But even if Free Break had absolutely no redeemable qualities besides the grammar was fine. So even if Free Break is a young adult thriller, and I'm all about thrillers, but I'm also super picky and I'm like super looking at it. Like I'm, I'm here to pick out the little details because I'm trying to guess who the villain is before we get to that climax. It is so obvious. But let me tell you the summary. In Even If We Break, we have five friends. Like they're all in one giant friend group but they're kind of on a friendship hiatus because two of their friends are having this intense fight with each other they hate each other one actually seems like she's trying to make amends with the other one who is this really bitter angry fireball of hatred he's like uh-uh i ain't having any of that now with me with thriller books have y'all noticed that the backstory of the character is like slowly revealed it tantalizes you gets you hooked into the thriller you usually don't know exactly what character, what MC you're dealing with until like the very middle or even the very end of the book. But no, we have five characters and they each get their own like chapters, like point of views. In like those first five chapters, we are just hit in the head with the backstories of each and every one of them. So info dumpy, sh not showing but telling and just very clunky, like not a good way to introduce people. So who are our peoples? Sadly, they're only names and one personality trait, but I'll do my best to make them kind of interesting. So we got the friend group leader. This is going to be Ever. Ever's backstory is that they're living in poverty and that they're looking after the little sister. They're level-headed, kind of cool, and they were my, not favorite, but my, but my most likable character until they did something so mean. Then I'm just like, wow, good thing you're on a cliff in this whole book because I just might push you off it. So yeah, we got the leader. Then we need the token jerk figure. That's gonna be Carter. Carter's like the stereotypical jock who somehow, like all the other people are like, oh, this guy is so mean. He's so mean, but I never like read any mean dialogue from him. So 
telling and not showing. Next we got Maddie. She, her only personality trait is that she's autistic. Great rep right there. And our final two members are the members that are like trying to like, they're really mad at each other right now. We have, I think her name is Liv. It might be Liz, but we'll just call her Liv. Liv is the stereotypical rich girl. And then we got Finn, the final member. And he's more like our main character. Like we got all these five people, but he's the main character. And because something that Liv did, he got bullied, picked on in this big fight. And she just like stood back and watched. And so like for the book, we're like, oh, what did she do? What did she do? What did she do? And it's like only given like a sentence of explanation. Even though it's like literally the chief dividing factor between this friend group and it's just like tossed aside and it was the main point of tension like it deserved to be talked about and it barely was but okay so our friend group is on hiatus they decide or rather ever decides because ever is the group leader they want to get the friends back together so ever devises like this giant game night that they can spin at Liv, the rich girl's fancy little cabin out in the woods so all five of them are hiking up to the cabin None of them really want to be here besides Ever, and Ever even now is like, I don't think this is a good idea because nothing healthy is happening in this group. They're all trying to like glare daggers at each other, probably throw real daggers at each other. But of course, this is a thriller book and we're going to a cabin in the woods. So the cabin has this super spooky ghost backstory. Like again, poorly explained and just like kind of thrust into the story just to make it look a little spooky. But the ghost story, ghosts killed some people, took their fingers whenever they'd attack, a, a music box would start playing, stuff like that. And so our group of people, they're chilling in the cabin and they're playing this ridiculously long and stupid and boring Dungeons and Dragon game. So that last 88 pages, yeah, for this 300 page book, almost a third of it is either just walking, poor dialogue, like honestly, everything out of these people's mouths sounded like a public service announcement. And then just bored gameplay, like a bunch of nerds, that's what it is. But then finally, finally, someone dies. Thank goodness. It looks like there's a killer among them. And this killer, they're like reenacting the old legend around this cabin. You know, the ghost, the music box, the missing fingers off, off the corpses. And this killer is going to make their way one by one through the rest of this friend group. Who's going to survive? I wanted none of them to. So we're going to talk about the thriller aspects first. It is so, 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 so obvious who is the killer. When reading thriller books, I have three rules. If you don't see the body, they're not dead. If the author keeps talking about a certain article of clothing for one character, they did it. If you can't keep track of one person throughout the book, they did it. Two out of those three principles apply to this. And when it's revealed, like revealed, like I knew who it was the whole time, but when it's canonically revealed who the killer is, it comes not even out of left field. You're walking in a grocery store and all of a sudden you just get hit in the head with a baseball. Like literally, where did that come from? It made no sense, came out of nowhere, and it was just stupid, stupid. Like it was a plot point that was never discussed before. Very bad plot and characters. The characters honestly was the worst. Like just right out of the gate, all that clumsy exposition about their dumb, dumb backstories. Their unnatural way of talking and banter, bad. Like honestly, it amazes me. This book went through beta readers, alpha readers, editing, querying, processing, advertisement, arts, and it got published. Who let this happen? Also, this book had one of our main characters yelling at our autistic character for not being empathetic while said character, Maddie with autism, is putting like bandages and first aid on a literal dying person. How is that not empathetic? Stupid book. I hate it. If you're an author and you feel discouraged about your writing, read this book. It got published somehow. There is hope for us. Like, we'll, get, we'll be published. So honestly, that whole book is stupid. Let's move on to something a little better. We're going to skip the whole two star range and we're going to go straight to the three stars. The next book with an extraordinarily pretty, pretty cover is The Lost Apothecary. This book was a hoot to bring to work. Like, I work at a gym now. We got like five or four like girl employees and we have like maybe two guy employees and I work the counter but when there's nothing to do there's nothing to do so I'm gonna like read in between work. So The Lost Apothecary 
it is about this apothecary that's kind of like, you know, black market hidden on the down low because in like the 1700s when this is happening, this apothecary only like serves women. Like you're feeling a little down, you, your aunt Flo messing with you, you come to the apothecary. You got some boo-boos, come to the apothecary. You want to poison your no good husband, come to the apothecary. This apothecary is protecting women and that is the chief mission of it. Hello, Colby. Colby, what's your favorite book? You must answer this question. Colby, what's your favorite book? His favorite book's Diary of a Wimpy Kid. So that's just one timeline happening in the book. The other timeline, present day, we have this other girl. I can't remember her name. We'll call her Elizabeth. Elizabeth is on her 10th wedding anniversary in London, but she's all alone. She found out that her no good philandering husband's been cheating on her. Mm. So she's doing a little soul searching in London. Like, do I want to continue this? Do I want to break it off? But she has all these expectations. She's going to feel like her parents won't approve of this. She doesn't even like the job that she has. So she's even considering, do I want to stay in my job? Do I actually want kids? Just all existential up in this mess. But while she's walking along the Thames River, she discovers this little vial, you know, little tiny jar. And it's blue and it's got a picture of a bear on it. And whoa, guess what? It's connected to that lost apothecary about 300 years ago. So she starts researching the origins of this bottle because she's also a historian. She's originally going to apply to Cambridge University to, you know, study some history stuff. But Mr. Husband wouldn't let that happen. No sorry. He needed her back at the farm to make some babies and milk some cows. But this story is all about how these two timelines are not coming together, but how the past is really having a hand on our girl Elizabeth's future. So how does this apply to me working at a gym? So, like I said, this apothecary is all about poisoning men, killing them. So it's a really pretty cover. So I would just like have it sitting next to me at work and my, uh, my fellow employees would just walk by me and they'll look over and see the pretty cover and they'll be like, oh, what's the book about, Casey? And these are all women. So I tell them, it's about this lost apothecary who helps women whose husbands have been cheating or abusing them and they give these women poison to free these women. And all the girls are like, mm-hmm. Like, I got my whole workplace, the female population reading this book. I don't know if this is a good or bad thing. Meanwhile, all the men employees who would ask me about this book, and I'd say, it's about an apothecary poisoning men, I would get the <laughs> face, that face, the judgmental face. So there's two types of people in this world, the ones who are pro-poisoning husbands and the one who are not pro-poisoning husband. But anyways, the plot of this book, it's a very, very chill, character-driven book. It's, I personally, like, I read Circe, and my favorite part about Circe is because she's a witch, she's like gathering the plants, she's making potions. I really, really like that stuff. I just like descriptions, like, I hate descriptions about forest and scenery, but I love them talking about just plants and like how they make ingredients for stuff. There's a time and a place for scenery and plant descriptions and this one was good with the whole apothecary thing. So even though it is about you know poisoning and murder and assassination it was very relaxing. The plot like the driving plot it's not that important. Sure there are some like things that happen to these characters and have to solve these issues but it's a very chill strolling book. I gave it a three. Like, I found it again super relaxing. It's just very pretty and prosy to read. But there are some things I just got a nitpick like oh how convenient this historian lady has like exactly the right access to find out where this vial is from and stuff like that. But my main beef is with one little character and she's in the past timeline. She's actually like the kinda apprentice to the lady who runs the apothecary. I think her name is Eliza. I could be wrong, but let's call her Eliza. Now, Eliza's like only 12, and the way that we're introduced to her, because the way these women who wants to like, you know, buy the services of the apothecary is that they go into this seemingly abandoned building, they go down the stairs, and they find this barrel. And then the barrel is filled with just like yucky stuff, like rotten grain, stuff like that. The women are supposed to put like a note deep in the grain, and the note's supposed to say, hey, I need poison, this is why. And then maybe they'll come back in a couple of days and they'll like stand by that barrel again. And if the apothecary lady, who is like hidden behind a wall of shelves, able to view without being seen this barrel of grain in the room around it and the people waiting for her, she's able to decide, do I want to take this on? Do they deserve this? 
okay, maybe I will. And she'll open it up and she'll invite the people into her apothecary. So our apothecary lady is looking out of her little viewpoint and she sees like this 12 year old girl just outside of the grain barrel. And like this 12 year old girl, girl she's described as like poised, intimidating looking, like she knows what she wants and what she's doing. It sounds like a very strong character right there, just at even 12 years of age. But for the rest of this book, that 12 year old girl, Eliza, is stupid. Like all that build up to a stupid girl. Like most of the issues with Eliza in this book, technically not her fault, but a big plot point is that she has no idea what her periods is. So she thinks that a ghost is like trying to possess her body and is making her bleed and stuff like that. So apparently her mom just like never told her about periods. The governess lady that she was living with, like kind of the servant floor, she like was starting to tell her what a period is, but just left it purposefully vague so we'd have this ghost plot point going on. How convenient. Our apothecary lady takes forever to finally say, yo girl, I'll make you a chart about what's going on. Also, Eliza is like the grand reason why everything goes wrong in this whole book. So she started out so strong, but turned out just so flickable. Like I just wanted to go up to her and just bop her on the head a few times. I think my main thing I don't like about this book, because I do like it, it's a three, it's fine. Is that I hate it when like so, like there's just so many conveniences. Like, oh, it's convenient this lady is a historian. It's convenient this information is just, purposefully put in such a vague context. Just so many mixed misunderstandings that just somehow build up into a plot. But it was very chill, very relaxing to read, very pretty, good imagery. The better timeline, because we have the 17th century in the modern day, what was happening in the 17th century was far more interesting than the modern day timeline. I would have honestly liked to get rid of this timeline altogether and just focus on the apothecary itself instead of on our historian lady, but you can't always have what you want unless you fanfic it. I don't feel like writing fanfic right now. I have two manuscripts I'm working on. I don't have time for this. I don't even have time to film this video, yet I'm here. <laughs> Anyways, three stars. It's fine. It's cute. It's a debut book, so it could only get better, I say hopefully. Next up, we have a Jane Eyre thriller modern day retelling and that's called The Wife Upstairs. Again, I have a whole dedicated review to this book. It's a 3.5, which is my typical good thriller rating. Like it's good. It kept me interested. There's just a few little nitpicks, but I still recommend it. So I have not read Jane Eyre. I do not even know what Jane Eyre is about. I kind of don't care, but because I've read or at least attempted to read, I've read this book and one other Jane Eyre and Space retelling. Since I'm reading all these retellings about the Dane book, I should probably read the Dane book. I will one day, I say hopefully, or not hopefully, questionably. So I didn't take into account how faithful of a retelling this whole thing is. I was just like, is it a good book? I'll, I'll just say if it's a good book or not. It's, it's good, it's good. So it starts out with this girl. Her name's Jane, as to be expected. Jane's living a super simple life right now. She's a barista, dog walker, just trying to make ends meet. She's living with a super creepy roommate right now. It's creepy and pervy, so we gotta get our girl out of that situation. But she's not exactly raking in the big bucks with her job. And when she's dog walking, she has to like put up with all these snooty rich people in this really fancy smancy subdivision. And she can't stand these people. What I really liked, I, I really, really liked our main characters in this book. There's three of them and they were all not innocent. Like they all had flaws. They were very gray morally gray, some were grayer than others. And I like that, no one was perfect. And like our main character, Jane, like she's looking at these snooty rich people. She's like, I bet like I could steal this diamond earring and you're so rich you wouldn't even notice it. So she does, she steals from these people and she doesn't get caught. Cause our girl's street smart too. But one day she's walking this dog around this subdivision and super hot neighbor guy nearly runs her over with his SUV. She falls, she's on, the, on her back like a turtle like help me and so mr hot guy i can't remember his name we'll call him jack jack so inconvenient comes out of his suv to make sure he's okay and seeing that she's not dead and very hot he's like hey would you like to come inside and have a coffee our girl jane is like okay your hotness has cured my whiplash so she goes and has the coffee with jack 
they start talking and Jane's like, well, I'm a dog walker. Obviously you almost ran over my dog too. And Jack's like, well, I don't have a dog. Why don't you come with me to the animal shelter and pick one out with me? So he, he wants a dog now because he likes what he sees. He likes this girl. He wants an excuse to have her over at his house. So that starts happening. And then like a little something, something starts happening. But I haven't told you one thing about Jack. Jack had a wife but she and her best friend died slash went missing in this awful boating accident on the lake. So he's living that bachelor life and he's kind of rubbing it in. Like it seems like he has no remorse that his wife is gone. One thing he pretty much says, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but he's talking to Jane and he's like, I know you want me. Like, aren't you glad my wife isn't here? Cause you can have me all to yourself now. Wow. What a dirt bag. And honestly, at this point, like 50 pages, I wasn't that invested. I didn't really know where the story was going, but then 50 pages in, we got the twist. And I'm like, ooh, I like, this is dark and devious. You may continue. That's as much I can go into. You can't talk about thriller books that much without spoiling something, but the main characters, that's what I love the most. Good characters, not for the good. They're all sketchy. And it's very interesting because our girl Jane and our villain, like the villain of the book, there's a lot of similarities between them two. Like Jane, she came from this simple life. She's actually running away from a horrible, horrible backstory. A backstory that actually has the police of her hometown looking for her. So Jane's not even her real name, but she knows what she wants. She wants that posh, comfy lifestyle, the lifestyle that Jack has. So she might like him, but she loves his money more. Like there's a ton of gold diggers in this book, tons. Like it's just gleaming with gold in here. <laughs> no one's good. Again, I dig that. Dig it like I'm in a mine full of gold diggers. Yeah, if I was the eighth dwarf, you can call me Goldie. So yes, good thriller. <sighs> the one thing, cause with me with thrillers to get that five star, you have to nail the ending. I read so many good thrillers that were building up to a perfect climax, but just completely fumbled at the end. This one kind of did it, because our girl Jane and the villain of the story, they're like squaring off, but all of a sudden this random event, like completely random, like comes out of nowhere and just like disrupts everything. And it's not ever explained how that random event really happened. It's left really open. I don't like that. I'm like, here's just a big helping of Dave's, that's Makeda save our characters. So yeah, I kind of lost all believability there because thrillers, you have to have the scariest aspects of a normal life. Everything has to be believable. The resolution for this book wasn't, but it was a fun ride getting to the somewhat disappointing resolution. Again, super good characters. All in all, well done. Continuing on with thrillers. We have, so get this, I, I love thrillers, but my least favorite thriller author has always been Ruth Ware. Like she usually has too many characters who I lose track of their names and can't tell apart. Super heavy on the description. I can usually guess who did what right from the beginning. But this book, one by one, her newest book, I believe, got a four stars out of me and I'm somewhat like appalled. Like, I can't believe I actually like this. It is good. So one by one has that Agatha Christie and then there were none vibe. It's literally 10 people who come to this very fancy chalet in the mountains. So, you know, snow and skiing on all that. Our main character, actually we have two main characters. You have Erin. Erin, she and her best friend, Danny, they're like the hostess who stay at the chalet. They clean, they cook, they make everything pretty for their guest. These 10 people who are like the founders and head honchos of this super cool tech program. They come to the chalet and our girl Erin's like waiting on them. But Erin also has a secret past she's escaping from too. And one of the 10 people who arrive at the chalet threatens to reveal it. So, uh-oh. And again, just like, and then there were none. There's this horrible, well, it's not like there's a snowstorm and, and then there were none, but same principle. There's a snowstorm that happens at the chalet. They were all skiing. One of their members go missing during the whole ski trip. So now we're down to nine of the 10 like member group that came to the chalet. All of our people are trapped in the chalet. The avalanche has completely pummeled the chalet. Like the doors, the front doors are literally pushed inward almost off of their hinges because the ice is just packed tight. You can't escape. The power's going out. Everything's getting cold. 
food is spoiling, they have no cell phone service, and then someone is killed. And then another person, and then another person, and then another, and then another, and then it just like spirals and we gotta figure out, oh my gosh, who's killing all these people? I have a whole dedicated review to it too. With spoilers and without spoilers, I marked it so you can watch it without worrying in, about anything. So I really, well, I think the big thing that helped with this book, because it's Ruth Ware, so she's crazy on the description, is because we're trapped in an avalanche in the same setting, one location, it made it much more easier for me to visualize it because it's literally the same place. I love the setting because I don't think before this I read a book that took place in a snowy area like avalanches. I've never had to deal with that while reading before. So it was good. I could feel the cold. I could feel the situation, just how heavy and claustrophobic it was. And I did guess the killer, but it took till page 229 out of like 330 pages for me to guess. So that's like an acceptable range for me to guess the killer because that means there were plenty of believable clues leading it up to that big revelation. So that was well done. There was a lot of like back and forth mental chess between one of our characters and the villain, like that they know that I know, but do I reveal that I know that I know that they know? Lots of that like back and forth tension. It was really good. It was in a part of the book that I thought would be really boring, but it was actually my favorite part. There was this epic ski chase in an avalanche at night in like one of the worst deaths I've seen in a thriller so far. And this this book had a huge cast of characters. We had like 13 people. But what I really liked about this is that in the beginning of the book, because the, these 10 people who come to the chalet, they're like part of a tech company. So the first like two pages of the book is like a website about us page. So it like gives the name, ages, and like a little bio of each of the characters. And it's like, it's, it is info dumpy but it's in a believable way. And it was really helpful for me to have that little guide at the beginning of the book, just in case I forgot who someone was, I could look them up. That was really helpful and that was well done and I appreciate that. But again, we do have 13 characters, so some people are gonna get, get more attention than others. And like I said, it's one by one. People are dying one by one. And it was really, really obvious to tell who was about to die because out of these 13 people, the one who was about to die would just have a moment, like they would just get like a little bit extra backstory. They would talk to our main character. They would have human moments, just something to really like put in an emotional connection, I guess, a last ditch emotional connection before the author killed them. So that was obvious, like, oh, who's about to die? It's the one who just had an emotional breakdown, it's him. Erin's backstory, that big, big thing she's hiding from and one of the 10 guests threatens to expose, it doesn't really go anywhere and it's not even that important. I mean, yeah, sure, it was awful for Erin what happened in her backstory, but how much does it have how much of an effect does it have on the plot? Not really. So that was a bit of a letdown. We have this other character, our second point of view character. Her name is Liv and her backstory. Loved it. So very minor things. Very good book. I liked a Ruth Ware book. Well now who do I get to say as an author who I've hated all of their books? Oh, there you are. One for one for hatred, my friend. Okay, and my other four star book is a book I did not think I would like. Like I was reading the first 20 pages and I'm like, there's way too much science in this book. My head is exploding, get me out of here. But I reminded myself, Casey, girl, you loved Blake Crouch's recursion, dark matter, and those are mega science heavy. Give this a chance, just try. And I am so glad I did because I ended up pretty much loving this book. It's called The Echo Wife. It's a very short thriller, but it's not really a thriller. Well, it is, it's just complicated. So we got our main character. I think her name is Evelyn. Now Evelyn has been separated from her husband. What's his name? Let's call him David. She's been separated from David for a while. Why? Because David has been cheating on her, but not cheating on her. Oh, how, how does that happen then, Casey? He's cheating on her, but not cheating on her? That's because our girl Evelyn, she's in charge of the cloning science. So while she wasn't looking, her husband went and cloned her and made a better version of her, kept this new Evelyn hidden. Her name is, oh my gosh, what's her name? Let's call her Pauline. So Mr. David took brand new clone Pauline, hid her away in a whole different house, and has been having an affair with that clone. That's not a spoiler, even though it sounds like a spoiler, it's literally on the dust jacket of the book. But our girl Evelyn finds out and she confronts David like, um, excuse me? 
And David's like, oh, jigs up. I'm, I'm not really going to pack up any of my stuff in this house because I already moved all my stuff to Pauline's house. So, peace. And he leaves. And now Evelyn's lonely. But she's just rededicating herself to her cloning science. She doesn't care what David's doing. She doesn't care what Pauline's doing with her husband. She's just like blocking that out of her mind. The reason David went out and cloned her is because he wanted a child, a family, and Evelyn is just is like stubborn. Like, no, I'm not having kids. I want the work. And that wasn't vibing with David. So he's like, oh, well, I'm going to go clone you. Yeah. But then one day, Evelyn, she gets a weird phone call. It's from Pauline, her other her, and it's a frantic phone call. Like, girl, I need your help right now. Get to my house. And that desperation in her voice, Evelyn can't help it. She has to go and see what's up. And what's up is super bloody and involves a lot of lime. Is that what it's called? Lime. Okay, I just Googled to make sure. It is not a spoiler to say, because it's on the summary and the dust jacket on the back of the book, that David is dead now. Not a spoiler, I promise. And now both of his wives, the clone and the original, they have a mess to clean up. And both girls, they both got that inherent ability. They're not afraid to get their hands dirty. Now, our girl Evelyn, one of the fights she used to have with David is that he would call her a hornet, you know, waspish, always having to hurt people for her own gratification. He calls her the B word. And to be honest, she is, but that's why I love her. She is mean and so interesting. Like, I honestly really, really like this character. This is a short book, 250 pages. I was so surprised that I ended up loving it. And besides the event that had David die, this is a super, super character-driven book. Like, I'm gonna say for 180 pages, honestly. The book is just about, uh, I don't want to say a spoiler, but it's just about this one thing. And it's not like a action-y one thing, it's a science-y one thing, creating this one thing. Like the technical lingo that goes into it, all the fun little aspects. And it was honestly really interesting to read. Like I enjoyed it and I usually don't like all that description, but this one was really good. It was a very slow burn, but it was worth it because we had really good characters. We had Evelyn, who is a B word, honestly. And we had Pauline, who is her clone, but she's like the opposite. So she's like super caring, empathetic, because David designed her that way. So it's interesting, it's interesting watching this completely polarized duo have to work together in order to cover up that David's dead. Because in this world, cloning is very like, it's on a tenuous line between ethical and illegal. She Evelyn has to like operate within certain parameters and if it got out that she has a living clone that's not like used for like organ harvesting or stuff like that, she's going to lose her funding, she's probably going to go to jail, and she's not really doing this to help out Pauline. She's really doing this to save her own skin. Also there were just moments where I really related to Evelyn. Like she's just so angry that Pauline has forced her into this situation that she didn't like want to be a part of. So she's just like on her phone, randomly reading one star restaurant reviews, just to, like keep that anger stewing. I've done that before. Honestly, I really enjoyed it. If you want, cause it is a thriller. And if you want a really actiony thriller, like a spooky one, this is not it. It's really just, it's very sciencey. It's very much about the characters and it's not about the action, like most thrillers are, it's all about the cover-up, the planning. It's all very planning oriented, oriented, oriented. Very sci-fi, which is usually something I'm not a fan of, but I really liked it. So I do encourage you guys to give it a try. But it, it is very sciencey, so you know, open your eyes, listen hard. Ooh, and this girl's backstory, Evelyn, really nice. Okay, y'all, and for my final two entries, the final finale, for my wrap up, we have a four star, the second book of a series, and then the third book of a series, which is my first five star since January. I've been do this. And it came again, not out of left field, but I was walking in a grocery store and it hit me upside the head with a love ball because I freaking love this series now. These two, okay, I think I've been considering a breakup with YA, but no. I've just been reading really bad books and it was unfortunate, but I found the good ones. They're mine. These books had the action, the world building, 
the beautiful imagery, the good characters, and oh, the love triangles. There was like a love dehecahedron in here and I was, I was over the moon. I, I was so happy, but also reminded that I'll never meet a man as cool as the ones that exist within these pages. I'm so lonely. Actually, like, now that I'm thinking about it, none of these people or the boys in this book were actually really good for our character girls, but they were dang sexy, oh my gosh. So what am I talking about? This is the Caraval. Well, the last two books in the Caraval series, the second book, Legendary, and the third book, Finale. So, little recap of what I thought about book one and why I almost did not finish this series and would have missed out on so much hotness. Dang cute guys. My lifeblood, my reason for existing. Caraval is about our girl Scarlet, who I don't like. At least in these, the first two books. In this one, she was redeemed. But anyways, first book, Caraval, it's about Scarlet. Scarlet is like the eldest daughter of this Duke character. The Duke is like super mean, really abusive. Like he's literally using his two daughters just to like sell them off to marriage so he'll like further his own position. So we have Scarlet, the eldest daughter, and Donatella, the youngest daughter. Donatella because she sees herself as her sister's take, uh, date taker, what? caretaker because their mother flew the coop years ago but because she's the caretaker and all this responsibility is put on her she has an arranged marriage coming up and it actually it's much more preferable than living with her dad so she's taking it very seriously like there's no time for fun then we got donatella who's the wild crazy child she's just sneaking out at night and everything and kissing boys oh my gosh scandalous but these sisters scarlet too used to be filled with love and funness like they still love each other but there's a lot of pressure on scarlet right now like it's no fun times but every year when like she was little and just learned how to write she would write to legend who is the carnival master of the traveling circus called caraval uh-huh caraval never visits the same place once and it's always traveling and it only happens like once a year and it's like this beautiful magical experience and little baby Scarlet, she writes letters to Legend, the ringmaster, and she's like, Hello, Mr. Legend. My name is Scarlet, and I am six years old. I would really like it if you would come to my house and I can see your circus. Legend never responds to these letters. He's a busy man. He's running a magical circus. So shoo off, you toddler. But every year, little Scarlet's writing these letters. Up until like the age of 18. Well, I don't know how old she is. But by that time she's 18, she writes her final letter. She's like, well, I guess it's actually better if you don't come to my island because I am, I'm leaving. I got an arranged marriage, so thanks for nothing. But then he writes back and he says, oh, I'll come. Well, you guys can come to me. Like my, the circus is going to be at this island. So here's two tickets. Enjoy. So like Scarlet didn't think this would happen and she honestly doesn't have time to go to a circus right now because the arranged marriage is happening in like three days. But Donatella, she's like, oh my gosh, we're going. Scarlet's like, uh, no, we're not. We can't. Dad will never let us off the island. So Donatella and the boy she's been smooching, his name is Julian. They're like looking at each other like, we're, we're going to kidnap you. So they kidnap her. Chloroform and everything. Like the rag just sleep. And so Scarlet wakes up and she's on a boat and then the boat crashes on the island. So now it's just her and Julian and Donatella has gone missing. And the only way to find her sister is if Scarlet plays the Caraval games. Because Caraval, I thought my main issue with the book was that I would, I thought it would be like fun. Yeah. I thought it would be really circusy, like lion taming, knife throwing and stuff like that. Caraval, because the whole magicalness of Caraval is that if you play Legends game and you win, he'll grant you one wish. So Scarlet wants to play so she can get her wish granted of finding her sister who's doing something on this dang island. And I don't like scavenger hunts. It was lame and the clues leading up to the scavenger hunt or within the scavenger hunt weren't like clues you could work out yourself. Like, it was very coincidental, the whole thing. And of course, we got Scarlet and Julian, they're shipwrecked on an island together, so of course they're the couple. I didn't like their romance at all. Like, Juliet, 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 no. 
He's a dude. Julian's fine, but he's just fine. Scarlet, though, is the one that annoyed me the most. Like, I kind of like that she was very rigid, like, it's not time for fun, I have something to do. She was dedicated to finding her sister, she had her priorities. And it made sense, because it was her character. But she has this thing where she can, like, not, hmm, like, all her emotions are colors. And if someone, like, yells at her, she would think, oh, his voice is livid red with rage. Like, everything with this girl has a color description. And yeah, it sounds pretty, but when, like, you keep reading it over and over and over again, it gets very tired very fast. So Caravelle was a three to me, and it is my honest opinion that this book in this series should have never existed. Because these books open up the world that Caravelle is placed in. Honestly, besides the results of what happened in the first book, like, the game, who won it, nothing there. Also besides like Julian and Scarlet like becoming a couple, nothing matters in regards to this book. These beautiful babies. Because Caraval is just about Caraval, the scavenger hunt circus thing. These books are about the world. Like Legendary. First off, the first book Caraval, it's in Scarlet's point of view, and it's all about finding her sister Donatella. The reasoning behind why Donatella went missing is just like so, it came off as so selfish, like Donatella didn't really care about her sister who has basically sacrificed her own happiness for her little sister Donatella. So I like ended up hating Donatella. Like I did not like these sisters like at all. However, Legendary is from only Donatella's point of view. So like I knew that and I was like, I don't like Donatella. I don't want to read this book, but I did. I did. And y'all, I love, love Donatella. She's so cool. Dang cool, yo. Like that's also reason number five why I don't think the first book should exist because it made me hate the main character of the second book. And also, like I said, Caraval is all about Caraval. The second book, it opens up with like, after like Caraval ended in this book, and it only happens like once a year, supposedly, but so soon after what happened in book one, the circus is happening again for like the Empress's birthday. So people are like, oh, Caraval, two in one year? What's going on? But it seems like there's some nefarious purposes behind why the circus is happening again. And it has to deal with the fates. Now the fates are kind of like the evil gods of this realm. Like they were there, they reigned the earth, they like tortured and tormented humans, but they were somehow sealed, sealed away. And it appears like some were starting to return. And this is a big uh-oh. And so in Caraval, these fates are like not mentioned at all. When I was reading this book, I'm like, where did this all come from? What kind of world building is this? But it's not this book's fault, it's the first book's fault. Like, it just seems like Mr. First Book is hardly connected to the second book. Like, I get we need the first book to kind of like establish the nature and what goes on within the circus of Caraval, but I think it could have just been done in such a better way that still involved the world building that's introduced in this book. Because now, because of this book, the fates and the stakes just seem to come out of nowhere. But it is so interesting so good. So we gotta deal with the fates, but one of the big things that honestly kept me reading the first book is that we're also trying to find out the identity, the real name of Legend, the Ringmaster, and Donatella. Because of the whole shenanigans she pulled off in the first book, she owes a certain friend, an unnamed friend, a favor. She has to find out Legend's name. So Donatella, Scarlet, and Julian. Scarlet and Julian have their own reason for playing round two of Caraval, but Donatella is playing it just to find out Legend's name so she can repay a favor. And also, she wants to ask that person who helped her out with the first book stuff to help her out again, because Donatella is looking, looking for her mother. Has been trying to basically all her life, and she's at a dead end and she needs to bring in some outside forces. And her friend hints that he already knows who her mom is, where she is, and how to reach her. But she has to bring him Legend's name. So we got the deal with the fates, 
Legend's Identity, This Mysterious Friend, A New Caraval. But we also have to deal with the love triangle, which was dang beautiful. Donatella has this lover, kinda, from the first book called Dante. Dante didn't have like a real big impression on me in the first book, besides he has a lot of tattoos. But in this book, uh -huh -huh. Then we have this other character named Jax who I love and is apparently getting his own book in a couple of months, so yes. <laughs> Can I just fangirl for a moment? Dang sexy. Like for the first book, because I hated just how much description the colors had, it really distracted me from the fact that Stephanie Garber has a really beautiful writing style. Everything is so magical and pretty and she's really good like describing touch, like you know, the kissy kissy huggy touch. And can I go back to Jax? Dang sexy man. He's the heir to the empire. Mm. So he knows status. But he also does this thing in the book. I don't know how to describe it, but like he's talking to Donatella and so like she's like snapping at him, just yapping because she does not like this man, but she will eventually. I would if I was her. I, I do like him. But he's like patronizing her, just like looking at her. And he does this thing with his lip and his finger. He's like tracing the razor sharp edge of his grin. And I was like, why is this so hot? And then I'm like trying to recreate it in the mirror and I'm like, how does, how does he do this? It doesn't look cute when I do it. So many twists and turns. It's the second book. I don't want to go to the plot because I want you to experience it yourself. But we can talk about the good stuff in the third book. Now the third book, it has Donatella again, but sadly, actually not sadly, Donatella shares her point of view chapters with Scarlet. Scarlet makes a return. My first Scarlet point of view chapter, I said ew. Like, I went ew. Like, I don't like this girl. But I, now I do because of what happens in this book. Why she's all descriptive about colors is revealed in this book. And I was like wavering between a four and a five. But I mean, I settled on a five. Because every time I was like, oh, I just wish this book would do this and it would be so much better. It would do that. Like it was reading my mind. It was Donatella in this book because of the stuff that happened in book two. She's like angry, so angry and such a good character. I really like this girl. But Scarlet, she's dumb. So she and Julian, like new couple, they had some relationship issues in book two. Cause you remember Scarlet was supposed to marry like an arranged marriage and a whole other different dude. But because of some things she found out about Julian in book two, she arranges a competition for her hand in marriage between Julian and the guy she was originally supposed to marry, a guy she's never met before because she says, she says, well, how am I supposed to know Julian is the one for me if I have nothing to compare him to? Compare him against a dude you never met? But he's just such a dumb plot point. Honestly, if I was to write this book, I would just kick Scarlet out of this. But no, I wouldn't. I keep saying that I hate her, but I actually like what happened in this book with her because there were some things revealed. There was a plot twist. There was many plot twists and it got really interesting really fast. My thing, my only issue with this book is that Donatella and Scarlet's mother is really hyped up as this big, awesome character, but it's, it's she's not. Like she's barely in this thing, but it, so good. Like I was, Hooked, I cannot let go. So good. Five stars. I loved it. I mean, this book redeemed Scarlet as a character for me, even after that stupid marriage competition thing. Like, honestly, if I was Julian, as hot and beautiful as he is with all his plenty of other options out there, I would have left. I've been like, girl, you're too needy. Bye. And again, the whole fates and the world building with these two books is so interesting. I'm so glad these books moved away from Caraval to what's happening outside of Caraval because it's so much more interesting. It's like they're battling, these humans are battling these really evil gods that are trying to escape into the world, take it over to their like personal playground kind of thing. And if that, those elements had been more in the first book, I would have loved the first book more. I wouldn't have nearly quit the whole series because of that first book if it just had something like that. But the series did redeem itself. I really like this and I'm excited to see what else Stephanie Garber is going to put out because again, she writes very well. So good. Just talking about this, I kind of want to like just reread my favorite scenes from finale and I can because this is the finale. I'm all done talking to y'all. So bye. I, I got a date with Jax. A hot, hot man. He makes apples sexy. Whenever I eat an apple now, I think of him. Is this an unhealthy level of obsession?
Anyways, guys, that's enough from me. I'm almost at a thousand subscribers, or I might be, so that's exciting. That means I got a Q&A coming up soon. Haha, <laughs> success. Anyways, y'all, thank you guys so much for watching, and until next time, stay reading, my bros.